Amen. Can you hear me? All right, you may be seated. Let me get myself situated here. First of all, I want to thank your pastor for entrusting me once more to share with you um, in the gospel. Um, I have gained a level of uh, appreciation for your pastor uh, over the years, um, primarily due to his consistency. Um, I've listened to his, his teachings and I, I, I told him uh, while we were in the back, I said, man, um, God is saying something in this season that very few are hearing. And I listen to a lot of preaching, and when I find somebody that I hear God's voice in their words, I pay close attention to them. And your pastor is such a man that has an anointing to articulate and to teach God's word. And you ought to be, you ought to be thankful. That's not common. That's, that's, that's not common. That's not something, that's not something you find everywhere. And then has an anointing to teach. And then has the prophetic gift. Then flows in the spirit. Has a revelation of the kingdom. Y'all blessed. Y'all are blessed. So I am I'm privileged to share in this time. I thank you so much for entrusting me with uh, this opportunity. Your wife, uh, Danita, I know she's a blessing to you. You couldn't do what you do outside of Danita and the Holy Spirit. I have, uh, I'm a witness to that. My wife is essential to my ministry. As a matter of fact, I don't go any place, I don't travel uh, without my wife. I don't. I fly halfway around the world. They'll invite us, invite us to speak around some, some other country. I'll tell them you gotta buy two tickets. I ain't coming by myself. And I've, I've had uh, uh, situations where because of uh, schedule and that sort of thing, um, I've had to go by myself and I feel like I'm, I'm walking like this. <laughs> I'm all off balance, something is missing. So I wanna acknowledge my wife, Gina. And you can stand <laughs> This is my co-pastor, my wife. Uh, we've been married for 32 years. Amen. <laughs> If you believe it or not, we got four grown children. Amen. Four grandchildren. And my oldest daughter's here, uh, Gina. Uh, excuse me, my youngest daughter. Uh, my youngest daughter, Nene, Gina Nicole, is here, if you could stand. And then our armor bearer, uh, so faithful, Gina James, if you could stand and wave your hand. As you can see, I'm, I'm surrounded by Gina's. But you know what the name Gina means? It actually means queen. So I'm, I'm surrounded by queens. So I am, I am blessed. Uh, I, want to, I want to do, do uh, something before I jump right into the message. Um, we have uh, what we call a Kingdom Conclave that is coming up. It's, it's uh, November, the, excuse me, December, December 3rd and 4th. It's right here in Dallas, Texas. It's where we teach the Kingdom specific uh, topics. We spend two days focusing in on those issues or those, uh, those topics. Um, it's an intensive study, and so if any of you are inclined to learn more about it, you can go to our website at uh, jcmatthews.org and we would love to have you there. Um, and also pray for us, we're, we're gonna be traveling to the Middle East. Uh, we do a kingdom summit over in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi uh, each year, and that will be taking place uh, next month, actually in a couple weeks, so we ask for your prayers for safe travel. Uh, everything that's going on in the world, we need to be covered in prayer. Amen. 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 Well, I don't wanna delay things any further uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to give you these two scriptures, and then I'm going to pray, 
and then we're going to move directly into the lesson. The two scriptures are Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 15. And then the second scripture is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Now, in that text, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. The first uh, scripture I gave you, Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15, that's the King James. And then the second will be Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, and that's in the New Living Translation of the Bible. And I want to use as a topic the work of God. The work of God. So, Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word. I submit myself to be used by you. Let my mouth be yours. I ask for a special anointing today to teach. I, sp I ask for a special anointing among your people to hear and to receive. We declare special anointing upon the pastor of this house. We thank you, Father, for taking him from faith to faith and level to level. Bless him in manifest ways. Bless this house to be a house of distinction. Bless the people to be a peculiar people. And we thank you in Jesus' name that we can receive it as done by faith already. Now, we expect to be transformed as a result of the word. We receive it as you, as your word. And we thank you that your word will not return to you void. We declare these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. I'm going to check my time. All right. So I ask you to turn to Romans chapter 10, verse number, starting at verse number 13, and we're going to read through verse number 15. It's in the King James Version of the Bible. Again, we're talking about the work of God. Amen. And it reads as follows. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Say sent with me. <laughs> except they be sent. Now go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Again, this is the New Living Translation of the Bible. Now these are the gifts say gifts. gifts. These are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. Mm. Amen. To do whose work? God's work. You said that right. The pastor the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, and the apostle, they are given the responsibility. They, they, they've been gifted to do this, and they've been given the responsibility to grow the people, say it with me, to do God's work. God's work. Not, not just man's work. God's work. And build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 So my assignment today is twofold. It is one to honor and stretch your understanding of the gift given you by God in the form of your man of God, and also to challenge your understanding of what it means biblically to be a son of God. In order for us to fulfill our assignment and work in this world, God has transitioned us from a dispensation of one inspiration to information 
to revelation, now we're in a season of manifestation. All of those are progressive. God had to make sure that we were empowered to do it. So there was a dispensation of the Holy Spirit where he was teaching us in the ways and the movement of God through his Holy Spirit. The church needed that. We see that on the day of Pentecost. And that continues until today. And then there was an information age. There was a, there, there was a time of instruction where we were grounded being, being taught and grounded in biblical truth. Because if you're going to flow in the spirit, you have to be able to recognize the spirit. The spirit is not going to do anything outside of what God's word says. And so we were grounded in uh, information and education. Then came revelation. I, I, I believe that that's the season that we just came out of. God revealed to us the greater context of what he was doing, and that is bringing to our mind, mind in the forefront of our mind, the revelation of the kingdom. All of these things take place within the context of the kingdom. That is the greater purpose of God, to manifest his kingdom. And now we're in a season of manifestation. Manifestation, where we are going to have to demonstrate what we previously confessed or professed to believe. The world now demands evidence as to what it is that we say that we believe. So we're in a season of manifestation. So this shift has been initiated by God in order to mature our, per our perception and understanding of who and what we are in the world. We can no longer simply perceive ourselves as being believers or church members. I'm going to say that again. We can no longer afford to perceive ourselves simply as believers or church members. But we have to come into the revelation and embrace the identity of being sons of God. It's no longer sufficient to say that you believe. The Bible says demons believe, but yet tremble. We, we, we have to, we have, there has to be a growing up and a, and a maturing that takes place in our identity. So we have to grow up to the place where the scripture says that we are equipped to do the work of God. Now the text, text shows us or reveals that there are two dimensions. And I'm going to stretch you today. I'm trying to stay on track. But I'm going to stretch you today and get you to, to step outside of your comfort zone as it relates to your identity. I'm going to use language today that might not be too familiar to your ear, but, I'll, but I guarantee you it's in the Bible. I'm going to show you in Scripture. And it's talking about you. My, my assignment today is, is that when you leave here, if there's a devil in your house and you come back home with this revelation, that devil is in trouble. Amen. That devil is in trouble. Because you are now going to be able to operate at a capacity that you were created to operate in. And I'm going to show you how it's essential that you have a man of God that's hearing from God. There, 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 there's something about that, the perception that we have to have of our man of God that, that will determine what we can receive from God. Amen. He's not just a man. I'm going to say that again. He's, he, he's not just a man. When he is sent and standing and fulfilling a particular purpose, he is no longer a mere man. I see some of you struggling with that online. <laughs> but I'm going to show you in Scripture where that's the case. And, and, and unless we have this proper perspective and concept, there's, there, there's only so much that God can get to you. Yeah. Many of us are praying about things and asking God for answers and looking up, and God said, I've already given it to you. 
it's going to come out of his, out of his mouth. But if you perceive that you're hearing a man, you're not going to recognize that that's God giving you what you've been praying about. All right. So the first, there are two dimensions that we saw in our scriptures. In Romans chapter 10, we saw that the first work of the preacher is to bring us to a place of salvation. We saw that the second uh, work or dimension to mature and equip the saved, already saved, to do the work of God in the world. These are levels of faith and living that can only be achieved through divine revelation. However, as I mentioned before, we must properly perceive the gift sent by God and resist the temptation of becoming too familiar with the man of God. Esteeming him merely as another man, thereby being unable to receive from God. Think about this. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, who was sure enough anointed, attested to by God from heaven. Demons recognized him upon, uh, upon, upon him appearing. The Bible says that when he went to his own hometown, that he could not do many works there because they consider him the carpenter's son. Somebody was sick there, they called him into the house. Jesus could not heal them because it's based on their faith. When Jesus would heal somebody, he, he, Jesus would say, according to your faith. We know that he could do it because when the the man who had the, de the demoniac son brought him to him. He said, help us, Jesus, if you can do anything. Jesus says, not if I can do any, uh, anything. It's if you can believe. So when he came to his own hometown, the folks that should have known him the best, he couldn't even heal a cold. After he done raised the dead, spoke the wind. After he done cursed fig trees cast out devils, raised the dead, and couldn't fix a cold because the people didn't perceive him properly. They said, this is just a man, this is Joseph's son. Oh, he, he grew up, we used to see him running around. No, 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 no. He is now standing in a different position. He, he occupies a different place in your life now that you have to be able to perceive. So familiarity can be fatal to your ability to receive from God. Anything that God does in the earth, he's going to use a man. I don't care what it is. If, if you're praying for a financial increase, guess what? It's going to come from somebody's hand, a, a man. You ain't going to go into your closet, your prayer closet, pray and fast all day, and when you go in there, there's a lump of money. No, it's going to come through somebody's hands. He, he's going to use a man to do it. God established the law. If he's going to do anything on the earth, he's going to have to find somebody, somebody with a body to do it through. So when God wants to speak to you, he's going to send somebody. And you have to perceive that somebody properly to be able to receive what God is giving you. All right. All right, so we got to perceive him properly. Watch this. Turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse number 20 and 24. I'm, I'm going to show you in Scripture where this is so, where Paul is trying to teach the people something. Now, I, now I'm a lawyer by... Uh, by occupation, and I use a lot of legal language. I'm going to talk about some laws uh, today that I, I need to get you to understand because they are essential for the season that we're, that, we're, um, that we're moving into. Essential for the season that we're moving into. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 20 through 24, and now this is the New King James Version of the Bible. It says this, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Now looking at that text, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, if so be that ye have heard who? Him. 
He's talking about Christ. He said, so you have heard him as the truth is in Jesus. So when you're looking at the translation of the, in the New King James, he says, you learned Christ, you have heard him, and it goes on and says, you have been taught by him. Let me ask you a question. How could Paul say to the Ephesians church that they had heard and been taught by Jesus when Jesus had died, resurrected, and ascended almost 60 years ago. Come on, I'm waiting. How, how could he say, he's, you, you've, been, you've heard him, and you have been taught by Jesus? Well, the answer is, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. The scripture told us that they were taught by Jesus and they heard him. Well, Jesus had ascended into heaven 60 years prior, approximately, to when Paul wrote to the Ephesians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, And we continually thank God, because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men. Not as the word of men but as the true word of God. He said, I, I rejoice because when you heard the word of God, watch this, you didn't hear a man speaking. You heard God speaking to you. Now, this is where I need for you to sit up because we're going to talk about some things that are going to stretch your capacity to embrace this new season that we're in, that God is calling for a higher level of operation. See, we're in a season now where if you say you believe it, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to prove it. You're going to have to demonstrate it. The decisions that we got to make today are life and death. And God is trying to grow us up quickly. So he's sending a word through the men and women of God that hear him that is designed to mature them. Not entertain. Not emotionally in, uh, uh, encourage. No, he's trying to get you outside of your comfort zone. Because outside of there, there's a whole level of supernatural living that God wants to demonstrate through your life that you have to be able to have the faith to receive. It's going to require setting aside an old mindset. You're going to have to learn how to talk to some stuff. Not like a man. I'm going to show you in scripture where Jesus taught his disciples to speak to creation. Not like a mere human being. There, there's, there's a transformation that has to take place in the mind. Now, Paul was teaching them that there was a law, which we'll also see Jesus likewise teach, concerning how God has established his kingdom to operate. This is why God sends you gifts. They have to be able to uh, hear from God, draw out of the scripture principles, not just surface level things. The men of God that God is speaking to today are, are pulling out principles that can be applied to your life so that you can live at the level that he's calling you to. That's not natural. Brother testified in the pandemic. He's prospering. Oh, you, you go a lot of places and they'll, that ain't the case. There, there's something in this world that's not of this world. That is for this world. That God has sent us into the world to take. But we have to think differently in order to embrace this. Now, what I call this law that Paul is trying to teach is the law of delegation. Write that down, the law of delegation. This, this is a powerful principle that you find in Scripture. The law of delegation. The law of delegation. Remember that Scripture that we read in Romans where it says, how shall he preach unless he be sent? There, there's something happens when you're sent. Oh, y all, y all miss. There's something, I'm going to say it again, there's something happens 
when you sin. There, there's something that happens in your identity. Listen to me, people. When you are sent into the world, you undergo a transformation. When, when, when God sends you someplace, whether it's that job, or sends you to, to pray for somebody, or sends you into the marketplace, you cease to be an individual. I'm going to teach this today whether or not you like it. You cease to be an individual. I'm going to show you how to walk supernaturally. Where, where it's not dependent on what you can do. It's dependent on the one who sent you what he can do. I'm not showing up as JC anymore. I, I, I'm showing up as something altogether different. I'm talking about you too. I'm telling you, when you get this revelation, you're going to see some things that have been stubborn and persistent. They're going to have to move because they're dealing with something different now. The law of delegation. Say delegation. A delegate is someone who is sent by another who is empowered to do what the sender would do if the sender was there himself to do it. I'm going to say that again. A delegate is someone who is sent by another who is empowered to do what the sender would do if the sender was there to do it himself. Amen. What, watch what Jesus said. Watch this. Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 20, he says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Come on now, open your eyes. So the, so the principle is this. Jesus says, if I send somebody, they cease to be the person that I sent. Because they now assume my identity to the one who I'm sending them. So the one who is receiving the one sent better recognize they ain't receiving just a man. They are receiving the one who sent him. Good God Almighty. Ah, so, so, so when J.C. Matthew shows up at the hospital and God sends me there, Jesus sends me there, they ain't receiving J.C. Every demon in the place better recognize a son of God just showed up who has on him the same thing as the one who sent him. Mm. I'm going to show you, the scripture tells us to put this on because you got to know this. It's available in potential, but it don't become power until you practice it. You got to have the ability to recognize, no, I'm going into a situation that I don't have the power to do this. So I'm going to have to put something on that does have the power. That when I show up, if it's super or natural, it recognizes that I ain't dealing with just a man. I'm altogether something different. Listen. Think about this. When, 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 uh, good God Almighty. When, uh, when, 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 when Adam spoke to the animals, Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says God sent him into the garden. It said, Name the animals. Now, watch this. He didn't create the animals, he was also a creature. God had to create him too. But God sent him into the garden to speak to the animals. And the Bible says, Whatever he called their name, that was their name. Now watch this. When he was speaking to them, he wasn't speaking to them as a man. God had sent in him in there and the creatures responded to Adam as if it was God speaking to them. You see, do you see the principle? When God sends you, there's a transformation, a, a transition that takes place. In not only in my capacity, but it has to be in my identity. I got to think differently now. Y'all have seen this on your jobs. You a laborer, 
and your job is to do this and that, this and that, they say, hey, come here, I'm promoting you. You become a supervisor. Now, the very next day, you don't go in there and do what you used to do. Your whole mode of operation has changed because you have now a different identity. Your authority has, your authority requires you to operate differently. Now, I do work by pointing. I don't pick it up, I point. And what I point to happens because of the authority that I possess. Just a day later, just a day later, I didn't grow an inch taller, I didn't get no stronger, I just recognized who I was. See, this is what's happening in the church right now. You got men of God like your pastor that's teaching you how to move in the Holy Spirit. He can't help it because the Holy Spirit, every time he wake up, I know God is telling him, listen, the people got to get to this place that I'm calling them to because this world is going to a place where you're going to have to demonstrate and walk in the power of God. It ain't worth, it, it don't want to hear your doctrine anymore. It wants to see some demonstration. It wants to see whether or not what you say is real. And in order for you to demonstrate, you got to be willing to engage some things that seem like impossibilities. How do they, listen, a miracle happens when there's no natural means by which that thing to happen is set for the supernatural. So if we're talking about miracle signs and wonders, that means that we got to engage some seemingly impossible situations. And then in that seemingly impossible situation, God gets glory out of the outcome because he had the opportunity to distinguish himself from everything else that calls itself God. He's looking for somebody who trusts him. So a delegate, now watch this, again, is someone who is sent by another and empowered to do what the sender would do if the sender was there to do, him himself, to do it himself. So what does that mean? That means that the sender is responsibility, his responsibility is to equip you to do what he would do if he was there himself. Put it this way, if you send somebody to the store to get something for you, to purchase something, you don't send them there with empty pockets. You send them with everything that they gonna need to get what you would get if you had to go get it yourself. Come on, think with me. So that means when God sends you, he's going to, if, 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 if God is sending you and he has to equip you to act like him, then he has to put something in you or give you something that has the capacity to do what he would do if he was there himself. That's the law of delegation. Now, this transformed this law. Jesus taught, Jesus taught this too. Teaches his disciples how this law operates and applies to all who are sons of God that are sent into the world to do God's work. To understand this requires a transformation of our minds concerning our identity and who and what we are in this world. When we are born again and sent by God into the world, we legally undergo a transition and a transfer, transformation in our identity where we are no longer individuals, but this is what I've coined, this is the, the term that I've given it, you become a legal man. A legal man. I got scripture for you where this is articulated, but I've given it a name. If you turn to, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse number 27 and 28. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. I told you that you become something altogether new. But I call it a legal man because it gives us a better uh, framework contemporarily to conceptualize what has taken place. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. From the King James Version, it says, For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now watch this. When you put him on, there's something that happens. Watch the text. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither bond nor free. There is me, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now wait one minute. You can't find, now Jew or Greek basically meant at the time somebody who has a covenant with God to somebody who doesn't. You can't find anybody in the earth that either has a, that, 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 that doesn't have a covenant with God or does. There is neither bond nor free. You can't find anybody in the earth that's either not bound to something or they're free. You can't find anybody in the earth that's either male nor female. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. You either male or female. He's saying that this happens when you put on Christ. So what this is telling us, that this ain't a natural person. Find me a person that ain't, that, that either don't have a covenant with God or do, that either not bound or, bound or free, that either is a male or female. You can't find a person in the natural world like that. So what he's telling us is that this is a whole new kind of man. Say kind of man. He's a legal man. What? Watch this. He said there's neither male nor female. So when the sister shows up to the hospital, she is not going in there as a female. She's going in there as a legal man. She is whatever the author who sent her is to the person that she's been sent to. Watch this. If Jesus sent you, and we know he's a healer. What showed up was Jesus in the body of that woman filled with the ability to heal. Oh, if there's a devil in the house and it needs to be cast out. We know he cast out devils. So if somebody says, listen, I got a problem in my house, you show up, you sit by him, you a devil casting out sister that just showed up. You're neither male nor female. <laughs> it's the anointing that showed up. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's anoint. It, mean, it means the anointed one. It's neuter. If you look it up in the Greek, it's neuter. Anointed. It, 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 means, it means that it, it, it can land on a woman or it can operate through, um, it, could, it could operate in a cloth, a handkerchief, or it could operate on, on, on in, 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 in uh, metals or woods or whatever. What, whatever God uses to get the anointing to you, it will operate through you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say, it's, it's hard. I, I almost want to go into tongues. I try to, I'm trying to say what God is showing me in words, and sometimes it gets difficult trying to see what, trying to say what you're seeing. But what I'm trying to get you to see is, is that it don't matter your economic status. It don't matter your color. It don't matter how tall. It don't matter how short you are. It don't matter what your education is. It don't matter the lack of education. It matters whether or not the anointing yes. is present. Now watch this. I got to move on. The, the, you are a legal man. Remember that. When I am sent, I'm no longer the individual that has a birth date. I'm something altogether. I'm neither male nor female. I'm neither bond nor free. I'm neither Jew nor Greek. I am something that have been created and have been sent by God to do for him what he would do himself. Say God's work. God. Now this requires a, a transformation in our mind. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 10. I'm going to read this to you because it talks about the same thing. It says, Put on the new man, which is, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So what this means is that you have to be taught this. This ain't going to happen by just going to church, sitting in a pew, believing. There, there has to be instruction specifically on how to be what you have become. Amen. How to operate and to walk in it. That's why the, the man of God is so essential. Like I said, there's some things that you can get reading from your Bible. But how do you, 
how many of you know that there's a difference between somebody who has been gifted in doing something and somebody who's just doing it? <laughs> Listen, the singers that we had up here were gifted. Now, I can come up here and try to sing, but you will be able to tell the difference. A gift makes the difference. So I can sing the same words, but watch this, it don't have the same impact. It don't fulfill the same purpose as when somebody's gifted who does it. So when the man of God has been gifted to give you something, it has a different impact than you doing it. Not saying that you can't do it, but that's his assignment. God has his hand on him when he's doing it so that it's not really him doing it. What did I teach you? It is actually God doing it through him. Mm. All right. Y'all ready to go deeper? This is the problem, though. The problem is, is for years the church has taught an incomplete gospel that has caused many to become stuck at the doorway of salvation being taught only what to believe instead of how to live as sons of God in the earth. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Let me ask you a question. What is the primary purpose of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I'm going to show you something. This is obvious, but it's not being taught. There's something that's being taught that's actually not even the primary message. It is an important one, but it's not the, 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 the majority of what we find in the Gospels. If I were to ask most people what the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, most of them would say it's about Jesus uh, dying on the cross and, 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 and saving us from our sins. Amen? That's what I was taught. That's what I was taught. But contrary to belief, the Gospels are not primarily about salvation. For only 5 to 10% of the four books called the Gospels are dedicated to recording Jesus' passion and what he did for salvation. Check, check your Bibles. So you will have 28 books, or excuse me, chapters in a book. And two of them, I guarantee you, check Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you got to go to the last two or three chapters to find any work that pertains to salvation. So let me ask you, if only 5 to 10 percent of the book is dedicated to salvation, what the other 95, 90 to 95 percent about? So if, if, if only 5 to 10 percent, now it's a very important 5 to 10 percent, but if that was the only purpose for the gospel, just, just, just give me two chapters. I can save you a whole lot of time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You ain't got to write those other 20-some chapters. Just give me those two if that's the only message that God intended for us to know. So what do we find in the other 90 to 95%? Well, I'm going to summarize it for you. I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. The church creeds, I'm going to show you another Another example, the church creeds. I remember when I was in uh, seminary and we were studying the church creeds, I, I, I wondered, especially now that I have the revelation of the kingdom, I wondered, um, there's something missing in the church creeds that is 90 to 95% of what the gospels give us. Watch this, I'm going to read the, uh, the apostles' creed to you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I want you to sit up with me and listen to this and, and see if you could pick out what's missing. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God, only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascends into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again and he will come to judge the living and the dead. There's more. What is missing out of that? We are told that who God is, the creator of heaven and earth, we, told, we are told that we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son uh, of, and, and our Lord, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Now the next time we have reference to him, suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, died, and buried. What's missing? His life. What he did, 
how he did it and how he taught his disciples to do it. This is why we don't know how to operate as sons of God. Because we have traditionally focused on the salvation of it and the impact that it has had for us. But there's another provision in the Gospels that's, that is just as important in regards to how you live in this world. Now let me give you what I perceive the purpose of the 90 to the 95% is. The 90 to 95 percent of the rest of the gospel, which is this, this is the full gospel, is a record of how a man, watch this, this is important. So the gospels, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, arrested at 90 to 95 percent, was recorded to provide us a record of how a man who is also a son of God walks by faith subdues and has dominion in the earth. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. Every part of that is important. Amen. So what we find in the Gospels is it records how a man who is also a son of God walks by faith, subduing and having dominion in the earth. That was the original mandate given to Adam. And when Adam fell, he could not fulfill this assignment. So when the second Adam came, it was so important that God led, uh, the, ho the Holy Spirit led God-fearing men, four of them, to record different aspects of Jesus as a man. He got hungry, he got tired, he got angry, he wept. Who was also a son of God, who walked by faith, not by sight, and he subdued creation and exercised dominion. Amen. 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 The reason why the Holy Spirit had four men to write it down because there had been no man in the earth like that since Adam. Amen. So therefore, creation had never seen that kind of man properly operating on earth. So God said, this is so important. I need to have four different men record how this man lived, how he did things, because each one of them will be sons of God who are also men that I'm going to require to walk by faith, and they're going to have to subdue and have dominion. Amen. So leave them a record to show them what this looks like. Amen. Let me, let me, uh, let me do this. Turn to Luke chapter 9. I'm, I'm going to show you some scriptures. I'm going to show you some scriptures where unless Jesus is teaching them this, um, they have no basis to even expect for these things to be a reality. Watch this. Luke chapter 9, verse number 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 and then verse number 54. He says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them preaching the kingdom of God to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from, the, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns preaching uh, the gospel and healing everywhere. Now go down to verse number 54 at the very end of this chapter. Verse number 54. And when the, his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and, con and to consume them just as Elijah did? Now stop right here. The first part of that said he sent them out to heal the sick and to cast out devils. <laughs> Right? So he sent them out to do this. Where would they get, now these are just normal men until they came into Christ, into contact with Christ. Watch this. And he sent them. When he sent them, they now had a different expectation. He says, when I'm sending you, you're going to do the type of stuff you saw me do. So if they were expected to cast out devils and to heal the sick, it was because Jesus had taught them to do it. Before they came into contact with Jesus and Jesus sent them, Peter was a fisherman. Yeah. 
If he saw a devil, I guarantee you, he would have ran another way. But now Jesus sends him. He says, no, you ain't going to run from him now. Because when I'm sending you, whoever you come in contact with you, they ain't receiving you. It's going to be me working through you. So cast out devils and heal the sick. Let me ask you about verse number 54. We, we chuckled about it. Where would they get the idea that they can call fire down from the sky? They have been taught that they can do. Now listen to me. These are, these are men, natural men. But Jesus is trying to teach them, listen to me. When you're engaged in ministry, when you're being sent, you set aside your own natural mind in all of its limitations. You got to realize now that you are operating as a different creation. You ain't a man now. You speak the stuff and it moves. I'm going to show you more. Y'all, can, can y'all handle a little bit more? Mark chapter 11, verse number 20 to 23. This is all through scripture. Listen, this is what we're missing when we don't pay attention to the 90 to the 95 percent that's been left out of our creeds and our teaching. Mark chapter 11, verse number 20 through 23. Watch this. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now Jesus had, pre had previously cursed it. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now watch what Jesus says. Jesus could have said, now don't even try it, that's me. Y'all don't need to even worry about this. But watch what he says. So Jesus answered and said, have faith in God. That word in is actually, if you look in the Greek, it means of. Have the faith of God or the God kind of faith. What type of faith is that? Well, when he says, uh, when you say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and do not doubt or does not doubt in your heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Wait one minute. Jesus cast, cursed the fig tree, and it died. They said, wow, look at that. Jesus says, wait one minute now. Fig tree? Mountain. Remember when Jesus said, greater works you will do because I go to the Father? He said, listen, you can speak to that mountain and tell it to get up from its place and take its residence in the sea and he says, if you don't doubt in your mind, it will obey you. Yeah. That ain't natural talk. That ain't, yeah, right. In the natural mind, that's crazy. But Jesus said, wait a minute now. When you do that, you ain't acting like a man. He said, have the faith. Oh, God, a God like faith. You're acting like God. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But you better be sent when you speak to that mountain. Come on. You better not be having a little bit too much wine and say, hey, 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 fellas, come over here, watch this, watch me. That mountain ain't going nowhere. There ain't no calling on your speech. Watch this. God's voice ain't in your words. God's creation is designed to obey his voice. But he uses man's words to get his voice in the world. I'm going to show you a little bit later. This is key. This is key. This is why the seven sons of Sceva were got in so much trouble. The seven sons of Sceva approached the man that was full of the devil. Seven sons, the Bible makes it clear, uh, uh, emphasizes that these were the high priest sons. So it's telling us these boys are somebody in the religious uh, community. But it gives us none of its name, none of their names. When you see in scripture where it gives you a description but doesn't give you a name, it's a principle. So what he's doing is he's saying, listen, these fellas were high up in the religious establishment, but they didn't know God. And this, this, the, these seven sons approached this demon, a uh, possessed man. He said, listen, I adjure you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. And the demon says, Paul, I know. He's a son of God. So when he speaks, I hear God's voice in his words. Jesus, I know. He is the word of God in the flesh. That demon said, but who are you? I don't hear nothing but a man's voice when you speak. Now you're about to take this whipping and get up on out of here with that religious mess because it ain't got no power behind it. Yeah. 
Boy, y'all get me excited. I'm trying to get to the end. This, this, listen to me. If, if this don't get you excited about what you have become by being born again, we need to check your pulse. I'm talking about something. See, a lot of us can't conceptualize this is real. I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is reading scripture to you. I'm not trying. I'm just reading scripture to you. This is in your Bible. Listen to me. Dr. J.C. Matthews made that up. Now go home and open your Bible in your bedroom and read the scriptures that I gave you and see if it says the same thing. Matthew chapter 14. I got more for you. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. See, we, we got to get out of this limiting mindset where we're afraid of stuff. I ain't even going to get started. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of dunamis. Agape. And a sound mind. Matthew chapter 14 verse 22 through 29. Watch this. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. And go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain by himself to pray. But when the evening came, he was alone there. But the boat, the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, and do not be afraid. I got to take care of that fear. And verse number 28, and Peter, said, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out onto the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked. Say, he walked. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, we saw Jesus said, listen, heal the sick. He said, listen, you can even call fire down from the sky. We saw the disciples trying to do that. He said, listen, if, if that mountain's in the way, you can tell it to move. He says, now, Peter said, listen, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. To walk on the water. Now let me tell you, let me, let, let me give you some context. They were in a storm previously, and they had to wake Jesus up because they were afraid that they were going to drown because of the waves were coming into the boat. Jesus stepped out on the bow, spoke to the wind, wind and the waves said, peace be still. There was a deaf calm. And then they said, what kind of man is this? What kind of man? He is a man who's also the son of God, who walks by faith, subduing and having dominion. That's you and us. That's you and I. So now they had had that lesson. Now Peter apparently picked up on part of that lesson. Because now he's a fisherman who ought out of anybody know better than to walk out, get out of your boat in the midst of a storm. So he must have had, come on somebody, he must have had a revelation. It's possible for me to walk on water just like Jesus did. And I stopped there with the Bible says, and he walked on water. He walked on water. I know he started to sink and we want to focus. No, focus on the fact he walked on water in the midst of a storm along with Jesus. Jesus and Peter walked on the water and they looked just alike. Why? Because Jesus told him to come. He was sent. He's, he's walking just like him. It's only when Peter says, wait, woman, oops, I'm a man. <laughs> I'm just a man. He started going. But while he had the revelation, wait, woman, I can do this. I'm anointed for this. I got to get rid of the fear that the things that I'm seeing around, I'm talking about today, the things that I'm seeing around us, I'm anointed for this hour. <laughs> the world looking for my voice. There's some things God has given me to be and to do that I can't be afraid to step into. Because there ain't going to be no answer unless I open my mouth. Because I'm sent by God. Uh. All right. I got one more for y'all. See, see, some of y'all are saying, oh, that's just a couple of scriptures. No, it's all through the Gospels. But like I said, that 90% ain't being taught this way. It's being taught. This is what Jesus did. But I can show you where Jesus did it, and then he turned around and told his disciples to do it. All right, let's keep, let's keep going. I got about 10, 15 minutes left. 
Matthew chapter 14, just the same, the same book. We ain't got to go anywhere. Let's, let's, let's go up to 13, verse number 13 to 16. All right. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to the deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot to the cities. From, uh, from the cities. And when Jesus went out, they saw a great multitude, and he, had moved, he was moved with compassion, and he healed the sick. When, uh, when it was evening, the disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitude away, for they, for they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Now, what's the problem? They got a whole bunch of people and no or very little food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I got to ask the same question. Where would they get the idea that even though we don't have enough, there's still enough? They must have been taught that they could do it. I got proof. Turn to John chapter 4 or John chapter 6. And it's talking about this same text. It's just John translation. John catches something that Mark left out. John chapter 6. See, we, we surmise that they had to have been taught this. He tells us that this is actually what happened. All right. Uh, this is the same setting. In verse number four, now the Passover was at uh, the feast of the Jews was near. Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming towards him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that they may eat? But this he said to test him, for he knew what he would do. Listen to me. You don't take a test unless you've already been taught. Have you ever taken a test? Listen, if you were taking a test and you have been taught, you'd be like, wait a minute, I, this, this, this ain't fair. You can't expect me to know what's on the test. But if they've taught you what's on the test, the test is simply to gauge whether or not you caught what was taught. <laughs> Jesus said, oh, good. Another impossible situation. I'm trying to train men who are sons of God to walk by faith, not by what they see, and to subdue and have dominion in the earth. I got to teach them because I'm leaving here and they're going to be my body in the earth. So they're going to have to know how to operate, how I operate. All right, I got to press on. I got to press on. So we, 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 talk, we talked about the law of delegation where, where you're sent, you actually assume the identity of the one being sent. Now I want to talk to you about the law of like kind. The law of like kind. Because being a son of God, we need to understand what that actually means. Because he was teaching them how to be sons of God. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a son of God? Well, there is a principle, there's a law that is in scripture called the law of like kind. And this is the law of like kind. It states whatever a, whatever a thing originates from or is an offspring of, it is like the original. Let me put it this way. Dogs have puppies and nothing else. Eagles have eaglets. Pigs have piglets. It, it, it follows, so whatever comes from an original is like the original. Can we agree on that? That's a law. You plant an apple seed, you get apples. You plant tomatoes, you don't get apples, you get Tomatoes, why? Because the seed that came from the tomato will reproduce a tomato. All right, we see the same thing in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 through 12. Now this is plant life. Now remember, law of like kind. Because we're asking, what, what, what is a son of God? What, what is a son of God? Well, Keep your finger in Genesis. I want to point something out to you. In asking that question, what is the Son of God, in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2, part A, it says, Beloved, now are we sons of God. Yes, are you sons of God? Yes. Come on, let me hear the fruits of your lips. Are you sons of God? 
So everybody in here said they're son of God. If you've been born again, ye are the children or the sons of God. I want to get that into your spirit. You are now, according to scripture, a son of God. John chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. I'm, I'm getting to Genesis, but I got to build this, found, this uh, foundation. John chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. But Jesus answered them saying, my father has been working until now. No, oh, now that's the problem. He said, my father. And I have been working. Verse number 18. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Is God your father? Now, come on now. Is God your father? Yes. Now, this is what religiously takes place. They said, oh, blasphemy. They said, God, you said God was your father, making himself equal with God. So they were going to stone him because they didn't have an understanding of sonship. And the word equal there, the word equal there does not mean to replace it's, it, it means to, it's the word Isus. Isus is iota, sigma, omicron, sigma. It means of similar or same kind. Similar or same kind. Jesus was simply saying, I'm the same kind as my father. I'm the same kind. Now that doesn't diminish or take away anything from God. I, 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 need, I need to get, because we're going to use a word in some language in just a moment that if you don't have this foundation, you're going to draw back from. But the scripture teaches us that this is what it is. So, so, so to say that you are the same kind or, or equal in a sense as they heard it was, was a derogatory of God. See, but in a family context, it's not. See, if you think religiously God's up there, he's distant, then that's, that, that sometimes, somehow impedes upon his sovereignty. But in a family situation, when my son say that I'm just like my dad, my chest pokes out. When he says, JC is my father, I don't feel offended. I say, yeah, he is my son. And, and he has the same thing in him that I have in me. Because we the same kind. Now sit up with me. Now go to Genesis chapter 1 verse number 11 and 12. Uh, I don't know if I have time to do this. All right, all right. Y'all forcing me. Okay, the law of like kind. Whatever a thing originates from, it is the offspring of and is like the original. In, in, in Genesis, chapter 11, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, plant life. Uh, God said, let the earth bring forth grass or herb that yield seeds and the fruit trees that yield fruit. Say, according to its kind, according to its kind. whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herbs yield seed uh, according to its kind. And everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every wing, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. So it's emphasizing that if it came from something, it's of like kind. So that's plant-like. All right? Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. I'm talking about the fish and the fowl. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which the waters are bounded, according to its kind, and every wing bird according to its Kind and God saw that it was good. So if it was a fish, the fish didn't have to learn how to swim because it was a fish. Swim was in it. If it was a bird, it didn't have to learn how to fly simply because there was fly in the bird because his parents could fly. So if the fish could swim, whatever came from him, it didn't have to take lessons. It was in him. It's innate. It's inherent. All right. Now, y'all shouted about that. We're going to get to a text in just a minute. But I wanted to see the same enthusiasm because it's going to talk about you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, land creatures. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind and cattle and creeping things uh, and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. 
and God saw that it was good. So if it was a cheetah, if it could run 60 miles an hour, whatever came out of that cheetah was a cheetah, it also can run 60 miles an hour. If it was a bull, it could pull two tons. Whatever came from it will have the inherent ability to pull two tons. He can't help it because it's in him. He's like their parents, or the offspring. The offspring is like the original. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, or say kind. Let them have dominion. So if the plant, if the apple produces from itself an apple, then the apple that came from the apple is an apple. If uh, the fish that came from the fish can swim like the fish, then we know because it came from a fish, it is a fish. The chick that came from the bird that flies, we know that it will be able to fly because it also is a bird. The cattle that came from the cattle also is a cattle because it came from in cattle. God said, man that came from me, who is God, the man that came from me has to be a God, or it does, or the law don't work. It's right there in the text. You are, you, God is the capital G-O-D. We can't help but be lowercase g-o-d's in our spiritual aspect because we're our offspring of him. Jesus told us this in John chapter 10, verse 30 through, uh, th uh, 31 through 35. I'm going to read it real quickly, but just write it down. John chapter 10, verse 31 through 35, he says this. Then, Jesus took up, uh, then the Jews took up stones. They just stoned him again took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered him, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? Uh, the Jews, verse number three, answered him and saying, for a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy. See, some of you right there, there or th you that are watching, when I said ye are gods, uh, you, some, some of you are right there turned off. That's blasphemy. They're saying the same thing here. They said, listen, you said uh, what you said was blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. That's the religious mind. Jesus goes on to explain to them. Jesus answered them and said, it is not written in your law. I said, ye are gods. If I have called them gods to whom, now this is what made them a god, a god, to whom the word of God came. So God sent his word to send them out to say what he would say. So when they were sent out to say what he would say, they were no longer uh, operating as a man, but they were operating as a, as a God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 7, verse number 1, and then I'm going to close here. Exodus chapter 7, verse number 1. It gets worse, y'all. I told you I was going to stretch you. Jesus went on to say in that same that same text, he said, uh, Jesus went on to say in that same text, he said, he says, you are gods if I have called them gods to whom the word of God came. And scripture cannot be broken. He said, so this is a law that doesn't, that, 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 that doesn't dissipate over time. He said, it was the same then, and it's the same now. If God puts his word in your mouth and sends you when you show up, you ain't a man. He said, you operating like a god. He says, because the one speaking through you is not a man. Amen. He said, the one who's speaking through you is God. Amen. So the ones who hear you better hear you like God's talking to them, or else they're going to miss what God is trying to do to or for them. All right, watch this. Oh, there it is. And the Lord said unto Moses, see, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. Good God Almighty. What did God do to Pharaoh? He sent him in there. He said, listen, go, he said, he said, listen, go into Egypt and I'm going to have you do stuff that natural men don't do. I'm going to have you call lice from the four winds. He said, I'm going to call frogs from every part of the earth. He said, I'm going to cause the rivers to turn into blood. I'm going to cause, listen, hell that's on fire to fall. How is that? Hell that's on fire. Fire. Hell is ice, but this is going to be on fire. They ain't going to be able to explain this. He said, but I'm going to have you do it. He says, to the place where when Pharaoh hears you, he's going to know that he ain't dealing with a, he ain't dealing with a man, that he's dealing with a God. 
Now, how does this apply to us today? Because it's a principle, it's a law. Gods don't listen to men. He said, Pharaoh thinks that he's a god, so I can't send a man in there. I got to send somebody in there that speaks his language. I got to send somebody in there that got so much manifestation and demonstration that even his knee will bow. See, we dealing with a God in this world, in the church, and we're trying to talk to this God of this world like men. God is saying, no, I'm sending you into this world, not as men. I'm sending you into this world as a son of God. It ain't going, nothing's going to move. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 19, he says, the creature groans for the manifestation, not of more men, but, as, but for the sons of God. He said, creation is waiting. Listen, this is why I believe things have not moved. The church has not opened up its mouth and spoken to Corona. Spoken to the powers, spoken to the principalities, not praying for God to do it. God is saying, no, I've given you, I've sent you into the world. You speak to it and it will obey you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hey, Yadadabasaka.